as I was saying a moment ago, uh, the hobby was my introduction to uh, the toy business. So just to give you an indication of the kind of work that I was doing then and also the kind of work that I'm doing now, I just want to show you a um, 54 millimeter figure. You can pan in. Thank you. So this is a 54 millimeter figure and in imperial terms this is about two and a quarter inches tall and this is a uh, metal casting of a figure that was never produced but this represents a British soldier in Afghanistan in 1842 and this is um, part of uh, what, have, what would have been the last stand at Gandamek. So any of you who know British history uh, know that this was one of uh, Britain's great defeats and uh, being half Irish and half German, I kind of enjoy that as a subject matter. Now, the kind of work that I'm doing today for the hobby is also uh, something that is hopefully a contribution to the hobby because here is um, a figure of a horse, a naked horse, in um, also in 54 millimeter. And the purpose of, of this model is that for uh, the more advanced modeler who wants to create their own work, this kit, among others known as Merklines Equines, is available to them so that they can use this as a starting point. The modeler would uh, buy one of these kits and that, then decide what kind of figure, what period of figure that they might want to use. And, uh, they would create the saddle and the, and the tack equipment and all that and then add their own figure, whether it's a conversion of a kit that already exists or um, something that's totally original. So this is meant as a starting point. And so there are a few kits of different horses available to them. Now, from here, we're going to come back to the subject that you're most interested in because it relates to uh, a personal story. And that is... Here is a figure that was given to me at one of our military miniature shows by Ron Rudet, who actually put this figure into competition as a practical joke. This happens to be the very first G.I. Joe that I did, and it came out in 1983, uh, but it was sculpted a full year before. That's how long it took. The masters were done a year in advance. And this character's name is Ricondo. So Ricondo was my very first. And um, uh, I sculpted a figure and I sculpted a hat. The weapon was uh, done by a staff artist up in uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Uh, it might have been uh, John Cook, I can't re recall, but uh, John would often do the weapons and I would only be called upon occasionally to do some of the accessories. Uh, that was very rare, but I would do them if they were needed. But I don't think I ever had to do a weapon. So there's Ricondo, and Ricondo is very special because it was given to me by Ron Rudet, and Ron Rudet is a principal designer of uh, G.I. Joe's, and uh, I'm sure you know his name very well. All right, next question. How many sculpts did you do for them? How many characters are you responsible for? That's, um, that's tricky. Um, I did work for Hasbro, among other companies, between 1982 and either 1990 or 1991. I remember doing between 60 and 70 uh, projects, which were, the majority of them were G.I. Joe's, but I can't tell you exactly how many um, figures I, I've done because I also worked on some other projects um, for Hasbro and, and uh, one of them was Cops which was another action figure line and another one was Visionaries where I actually worked on the miniatures that became the holographic uh, shields and uh, heraldry uh, for Visionaries and there was a project that we did that made it to Toy Fair but was never seen after Toy Fair because it was an absolutely horrible idea. And the line was called Tribes. 
and uh, they, they, it was an action figure series, and they were kind of like savages, and they had these masks that you could remove, and I could never quite figure out what was on their mind creating this. There were some other things. Uh, Air Raiders was um, a ripoff of a Coleco uh, toy that uh, was certainly not a, a bad design, just had a flaw that I think uh, uh, cost the, uh, the line any interest. I worked um, with three art directors at uh, Hasbro in the period that I worked with them, and uh, two of them were connected with the G.I. Joe line. The first art director was uh, Roger Avery, and um, this, of course, was the second toy company that I was working for, but in all honesty, it was an amazing experience to begin at the top. Uh, Roger was an amazingly uh, astute and professional art director. He was on top of his game all the time, and uh, we had a wonderful relationship. And the way that you have a wonderful relationship with an art director is, is very simple, and that is that if you ever want to become a commercial sculptor, uh, there are a few things that you uh, need to know. And one is that the purpose of a commercial sculptor is to give the art director what they're looking for. You don't get the opportunity to be an artist and reinvent the wheel. What your purpose is, is that you are working um, by yourself, but you are working with a team of very select and very few people who do this field of commercial sculpting. And what is necessary in that is that the toys that you create have um, a continuity with toys that already exist. So that doing G.I. Joe's meant that I had to know what the G.I. Joe's look like, and I had to stay within the parameters of the look the whole feeling of the Joes and where my sculpting might have an edge here and there. It wasn't so far removed as to be thought of something that didn't fit the rest of the line. The quality <clears throat> that an art director looks for is um, a person who's very reliable, a sculptor who's very reliable. Because if you're in the position of being an art director, you are given assignments to have these jobs done and you know that you need to have a certain amount of time to cover the possibility of an absolute disaster. And an absolute disaster might be that you are working with a new uh, artist and uh, what that person sends you is a total loss. There's no way of dealing with it except to scrap it and find somebody else to do it. So that means that you need a safety net as an art director and that cuts the time for the, um, for the sculptor to be able to do the project because they need that little safety afterwards in case there is a disaster. So sculptors basically get a lot less time than they really need to get this kind of work done. And you learn as a commercial sculptor how to take leaps, how to take shortcuts, how to take risks in order to get from part A to part B. If you do it in a traditional way, you may be wasting time. And so this is part of the talent of being a commercial artist, is how to solve problems quickly. And if you can solve a problem and get the work done before deadline, then you are prized automatically by, by your art director. Your art director loves uh, uh, an, a uh, sculptor that can get the work done on time and then will absolutely adore a sculptor who can get it to them early. That just gives them more freedom of movement to move up the schedule for the next pieces so they're really very much ahead of the game. So Roger, as I said, was this amazing art director and I didn't realize that uh, until way down the line working with other companies and uh, I'm not going to name names here, uh, but just to say that, that uh, as older people left the position, that is to say more experienced art directors, and they were replaced by young people coming out of college with no background in this field, because honestly, the college university doesn't train you to do this, then I was dealing with people that I had to educate 
in the terms that we use, the, the um, terminology, I should say, uh, for our business. And so you were dealing with people who were really um, out in uh, left field. That's an American expression. Uh, but you get the point. Uh, Roger uh, and I worked for a number of years and we had a wonderful relationship. And Roger moved on and was replaced by the second um, art director for the G.I. Joe's, Ken Ellis. And Ken was also a first-rate uh, art director. When I was switched over from G.I. Joe's, the third art director that I worked with was uh, Larry Griffiths. And Larry Griffiths was an art director with Play School. So I actually was able to make some toys that weren't vicious. It was very nice to have that break, uh, to, to work on things that were not cruel and deadly looking. Uh, after a while, when you find yourself sculpting somebody's portrait, you can't help but put a scowl on, on the face because uh, you've done so many of them for G.I. Joe. Larry also was a, a great art director, and uh, I enjoyed the uh, projects that I did with him before uh, moving on to work with other companies. But I should tell you <clears throat> that during the period that I was working with Hasbro, I was also working with another with other toy companies and also companies in other fields that needed commercial sculpting. And uh, that included uh, companies like the Franklin Mint and also uh, American Banknote. But we'll get to that in a moment. So let us, let's see what the next question is. Uh, what is. What is your least favorite G.I. Joe sculpt? I, I don't really have an answer for that. Um, I guess I wasn't paying too much attention, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, what was the most challenging G.I. Joe sculpt or character that you had to work with? Again, there's, there's nothing that really stands out. Um, the challenges are unique to each figure and require uh, different solutions, but they all get done. I'm, I have to say that in regard to the thing I was telling you earlier about the military miniatures, uh, the sculpting demands that were made uh, for working with miniature figures, or the, especially the work that I did with American Banknote and Holographic Securities, that made G.I. Joe's, frankly, a breeze. I don't remember any G.I. Joe figure that I, I struggled with. Um, it was all fun. Okay, why do so many figures have big head syndrome? I don't know. I, I was careful about, about my heads. I hope you don't feel that any of my sculpts have suffered from big head syndrome. But we did sculpt um, pretty much what we were asked to sculpt. Why does CoverGirl resemble Scarlet? Scarlet is before my time, and I have no idea who Covergirl is. 